Beloveds, today we are examining our second principle. Justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. This is the fourth sermon in our series on the what we hope will be the eight principles. We have seven so far. We've already looked at the fourth, fifth, and third principles, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, and today, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Obviously, we have not been taking them in order. Religions in the world have a lot to say about justice. And sometimes, sometimes people mistake justice to mean punishment. And they're not equivalent words. Sometimes people think justice means retribution. That's not what it means. And sometimes people mistake equity for equality. And that's not exactly what equity means. And sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that compassion means sympathy. And that's not what compassion means. So let's, let's look at justice, equity, and compassion. Why do we want to look at these together? If you've been following the news, you know that Derek Chauvin is on trial right now in Minneapolis. He's on trial for the murder of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin is a white police officer. George Floyd was a black man whose big crime possibly was maybe passing a phony $20 bill in a convenience store. The defense has been trying to put George Floyd on trial. Well, this happens a lot. But my friends, there is no justice in executing someone on the street with no trial. And it almost doesn't matter if George Floyd did a thing or not because that's not what we've said our justice system is about. And for comparison, I want to remind you that Dylan Roof, a white man, walked into a black church, sat down and did Bible study with them and then got up and killed nine people in the church. And the police took him alive and took him to Burger King. Okay. 
Now, I'm not saying that the police ought to have killed Dylan Roof because everybody, every accused in this country deserves a trial. But I'm saying that when black men are routinely killed first and questions are asked later, that is not justice. We have self-fulfilling prophecies. If we tell ourselves that some people are more dangerous than others, then we're primed ahead of time to assume those people are dangerous. We're primed. to expect bad things. Many years ago, many years ago, Jesse Jackson said that he was also scared if he was walking alone and saw a black person, a black man on the street. And a lot of white people took that to mean, see, see, I was right to fear black people. But what he was saying, what he was saying is that this racism is so ingrained in all of us that even black people have been taught to fear black people. That is not justice. That is not equity. That is not compassion. Our society has primed us not to see people as fully human, but rather to see people as well as a set of algorithms. There's an interesting documentary that's available on Netflix right now, and I highly recommend it. It's called Coded Bias. It's precisely about algorithms. Any math geeks here? I know that I know we have some math nerds among us. I say that with absolute love and respect. There's a lot of, it's not higher math, but it talks about math and algorithms and how we code things. And it starts out with a doctoral student at PhD, a black woman who was doing work and needed some facial recognition software. And she couldn't make it work unless she put a white mask on her face. Why is that? Because computers aren't smart by themselves. They learn what we feed them. And the data sets that they were fed were primarily of white men. So it's part of this self-fulfilling prophecy. When white men build the system, we get a system that biases toward white men. Do you know the history of the standardized tests, the SATs? These tests were literally designed to keep out the undesirables, people who weren't white and Christian and upper and middle class, 
from the schools that really didn't want folks who weren't white and Christian and middle class or above or upper class to attend. The tests are filled with bias and studies have shown that the best predictors of how well you will do on the SATs are really your parents' income and race. The tests do what they were designed to do. To keep the poor and marginalized, poor and marginalized. More and more schools are doing away with asking for ACT and SAT scores precisely for that reason. And yet, the people with privilege, many people with privilege still cling to them, but my child did so well. Well, yes, that's the point. We train ourselves to think in certain ways. Some of you have healthcare and medical backgrounds. So if I said to you a 70 kilogram man, you know what that means. But for the rest of you, medical testing for a long time just assumed a 70 kilogram man. And what was unsaid was it assumed a 70 kilogram white man as the default human being. But amazingly, amazingly, many people, most people are not 70 kilogram white men. And over time, it was discovered that people who aren't 70 kilogram white men have different symptoms, react differently to medication, but things were never tested to include them. And so there's a healthcare disparity. So I wanna try an exercise with you. I want you to think of a person, just any person. Think of a person and this person is a successful educated person someone you admire and emulate. This person has an engineering degree and um, is a, an up and coming designer of robots. And this person has won all kinds of awards and scholarships and is really going places. Now this person in your head, does this person have a gender? What color skin does the person have? How about a religion? Does this person have any tattoos? Dyed hair? If you're a white man and you imagined a white man, well, that's you imagine somebody like yourself. But if you're not a white man and the person you imagined is a white man, and I'm not gonna ask you to identify yourself. You already bought into some of that 
well, it's an engineer, it's got to be a man, and it's got to be a white man thing. It's hard to be what you can't see. One of the reasons I'm here with you today, here with you today and not a rabbi, right? Is that I felt pushed out of the synagogue. I was not allowed to read from Torah because I was a woman. I could see no women rabbis, not, not at the time that I was coming up. And it didn't seem equitable to me. How do we change our default thinking? Part of it is changing it in ourselves and checking our own assumptions. And in order to, to do better, if we're in a privileged situation and in different situations, we might be privileged at one time and and not privileged in another. But if we are in a privileged situation, we must work to decenter ourselves. <clears throat> that means not making it all about us. So if we've done something unjust, even if we didn't mean to, we can't turn it into, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, let me tell, because now I've centered myself. We have to have compassion and say, wow, I need to listen more. How can I help? Those of us who are white need to get out of our white savior complex. We need to get out of that thinking that tells us that there are bad neighborhoods and good neighborhoods. You know, I think the most dangerous neighborhood in New York City is Wall Street, frankly. I think that's done more harm to more people than any other neighborhood in New York. But when we assume a neighborhood is bad, what does that mean? We assume the people in there are bad. People are raising babies in those neighborhoods. change our mindsets. Now, there might be neighborhoods that you prefer to live in and neighborhoods that you prefer not to live in, and that's fine. We need to shift our thinking. We need to stop assuming we have all the answers. Listen. And ask, what's the best way I can help you? What do you need from me? That can be really hard. That can be really hard when we want to help. When we think we know. But it's important. 
We need to team up with agencies that are doing work. We need to speak up, we need to vote. Now, in 2017, the UUA General Assembly was held in New Orleans. And two UUA staffers were attacked one evening and mugged and hurt, like seriously hurt. And the perpetrators were caught and they were both young men of color. And we wanted, as a denomination, people wanted to, to work for restorative justice, but here's the thing. Compassion demands that we care for those who have been injured first. And so first, folks went to the staffers who were hurt and their families and said, what do you wanna do? And they agreed that the UUA should work for restorative justice. Now this is Louisiana, not, not a state known for its tremendous work on restorative justice. But UUs showed up every day in the courthouse sitting in the front row with t-shirts asking for restorative justice. Our UU presence was there. And they kept up with, with the two young men in prison. Justice demands that we care first for those who have been hurt. It means we care for George Floyd's family, that we can't just use him as a symbol. We must care and have compassion for his family. Equity demands that we provide access fair footing for everybody. Not equal, but level, so that everyone has a fair shot. Compassion, compassion demands that we see each person, not as an algorithm, not as a predictive set, but as one individual to another, a being who carries the divine spark. It doesn't mean we make doormats of ourselves. It doesn't mean we set ourselves up to be hurt. It does mean that we recognize the humanity in everyone. If Derek Chauvin had had any humanity, had had any compassion that day, George Floyd would be with us now. Will you help me make this world a better place? Can we live out our second principle? With justice, equity, and compassion. The divine in me recognizes the divine in you.